Good afternoon. I want to thank Pastor David and ask me to help facilitate today's gathering. Maya Angelo once wrote, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Pat was one of those people who would always make people feel invited and welcome. To the many young artists she mentored was a passion. Pat made everyone not just feel good, but also feel important and valued. I know some of you are still reeling from Pat sudden and unexpected passing. And for someone like Pat, even if you had another 20 years, but looking out at everyone here today, I see so many people that love, and I realize that even in death, she is looking out for us. And we are here to support each other. Thank you so much for taking the time to help us say goodbye to our dear Pat this afternoon, and to celebrate a life well lived. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Today I'm going to uh, offer a poem. It's called A Life Well Lived. A life well lived is a precious gift of hope and strength and grace from someone who has made our world a brighter, better place. It's filled with moments sweet and sad, with smiles and sometimes tears, with friendships formed and good times shared, and laughter through the years. A life well lived is a legacy of joy and pride and pleasure, a living, lasting memory our grateful hearts will treasure. Some thoughts. I'm still in disbelief that Pat is gone. Our mother just a hundred people thought we were here. Her mom told you to. Pat was the smartest and most creative person I knew. And we will miss her. Her artistic talent was exceptional since childhood. I was born with number eight of nine children in exact age, two and a half years older than I am. As a child, Pat was drawing complex pictures of dinosaurs and other animals when other children her age were drawing stick figures. Growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, we were always inventing new ways to play. In the winter, our yard just didn't have snowmen. We had snow horses, dinosaurs, bunnies, unicorns, and other animals <laughs> and colored the fake pictures. And we actually did have dinosaurs, and we then we used uh, sticks to support their legs and so on and so forth. We also dyed binder twine and braided it to make halters and trained caps to be halters. Cat Pat was involved in 4-H for 10 years. Our father was a 4-H leader. One of Pat's projects was block printing a tablecloth that the judges at 4-H fair said was done professionally. They were going to disqualify it until Pat convinced them that she did it herself. <laughs> and um, Justin, there's a white cloth in my purse. Can you hand that to me? This is what's left of her tablecloth. I was going to bring you the tablecloth, but she cut it up to make masks for the pandemic. Which is typical of Pat. You can see the cow and the windmill and everything there. Pat also showed Cap at the 4 H Fair and got into cow judging. Cap won first place at the Wisconsin State Dairy Judging Contest and was slated to go to the Nationals to compete. However, they said she couldn't go, quote unquote, because she was a girl and no girl could be possibly that good. <laughs> I asked Cap later how she was so good and she said she simply memorized the confirmation of the idea of dairy cow. Our father's attitude was that college was a base for girls, because all we were going to do was get married and have 
babies. <laughs> Our two oldest sisters married two brothers and had ten children each. And my niece Diane was here for twelve kids. Growing up, I saw the same for my future. But Pat broke the mold and essentially ran away to college when she was 17 to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Pat received her bachelor's degree in art in 1969. She was my inspiration to go to college traveling in Europe. Pat moved to California when she came back from Europe, specializing in freelance work. And you can see some of her work over on the tables there. Um, I moved to California about a year later. We lived together for a few years and shared many adventures together. Pat attended Art Center College of Design in Pasadena and obtained a master's degree in art in 1981. I because it seemed to be a good match. I remember seeing an issue of the competitor's magazine that was no match for the layout and artwork of the girls' magazines. My sister Pat Lindsay had a light bulb. She was a kind person that many friends. She was compassionate toward others and a willingness to have her many friends and family. Right now, I've been asked to invite uh, some other talented people I've known, people specialize in the field and know a lot about that field, and have some general knowledge about other things, have information about a subject she didn't fully understand or was unsure of. And she always said she could tell relatively soon in the conversation if they were just trying to outsmart her or if they had a real mental health issue. <laughs> if she spotted that mental health issue, she would always say, what does your therapist say about that? And at that point, I would think they would get angry and hang out. But they never did. <laughs> Instead, they always told Pat just what their therapist had to say. <laughs> I've known her my entire life, and because my mother was what was her the, was the oldest in a large family, and Pat was next youngest, there was only a seven-year difference in our ages. This did confuse some people who met us. Some of you have known Pat for years, and some have encountered her at different times in her life, and I want you to see the path that I am. When she was in high school, she often went to cattle auctions and did cattle judging with her father. At one of the auctions, the auctioneer brought out a beautiful and spirited horse, and just before the bidding started, the horse kicked out with both of its hind legs. At that same moment, her father had bent down to tie his shoe, so he missed what the horse had just done. The auctioneer then opened the bid at $100, and only her father bid on the horse. <laughs> Pat had no problem training or riding that horse, and I don't think she ever told her father what had happened. She never lost her skill of riding a horse and amazed some horse anglers in Calico that the naughty horse she was on didn't misbehave when she was rocking him. Apparently, he always went to the bamboo, but what Pat was on him, he did not. He must have known by how she sat and how she pulled the reins that she would correct him and be straight. Apparently, it was the first time he didn't go with that bamboo. When she went to the University of Wisconsin Madison at the age of 17, her parents drove over there and dropped her off. She didn't even have coffee or anything. Many who remained friends with her. She was attending the UW at a time when there were anti-war protests going on. And although she's not actively involved in the protests because of the way the police treated all the college students, they were dirty hippies, I, I think it caused her to have some sympathy for their cause. It's hard to explain to someone not there how violent the feelings could be in the 60s. With riot police around each corner, and outside agitators always stirring up trouble. She saw this firsthand and knew what was going on even before information came out years later that FBI agents were the agitators. When I started in 1972 at the same university, things had calmed down so much that there were bonfires on State Street, State Street when Tricky Dick Nix resigned. If you weren't there, it may have been hard to understand, but just think about what happened at Penn State. If you want to better understand what Pat did, she lived it. She's part of it and the shape of views. If you've ever seen a picture of Pat from 1968 at the age of 21, standing in front of a VW bus with confetti in her hair, you see a real Pat, Pat I knew. Pat was never one to conform or want to climb the corporate or social ladders. 
She was a warm-hearted and loving beauty up to the end. When Pat was presenting her portfolio to art directors, she was often mistaken for Pat Lindsay's agent. I believe this is the reason she never used the name Patricia. It was hard to get any work in the art industry in the early years because she was young and female, and no one thought she could possibly be that good. Even when she drew art right in front of them. For those of us, the Kibbutz had some very tough people living there who had survived living in Warsaw ghetto during Hitler's Germany. When she arrived, they asked her if she wanted to work in the laundry or the kitchen or in the kinder care. She said, I want to be gorgeous. They thought that they would humor her and just, well, that won't last long. And after picking all the oranges, it, they, the hard work they thought most rich Jewish kids of America couldn't even do, she couldn't last long. You can probably guess that how it's them all. She knew how to work hard and wasn't bothered by it. And liked being out in fresh, cold air, which was nothing like the cold of Wisconsin winter. Somewhere along the way, they discovered her talent for drawing. She was probably out drawing pictures for the kids. The children would play the bunkers on the books, and they commissioned her to paint murals for the walls. I think if you were to go there today and check out, she became involved in the skeptical movement. I think the combination of science and critical thinking was what attached her to this movement. She liked to talk, talking people through the critically, the critically thinking about things, and I think she truly enjoyed doing this. It drove me crazy when she would go for the right wing conspiracy spam on her computer. But she said she was just trying to figure out her thought process. She was always curious. She didn't believe in their conspiracies, but she wanted to know how her mind works. She was quite interested in how cults work and often drew parallels to conspiracy theorists. She also enjoyed the many geology tours at the Skeptic Society Hall. She loved collecting fossils and buying to go to Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons, but we had to cancel since COVID hit the year we were going to go. We both went for a long time afterwards. She was planning on going again to the 2024 Prince of Texas. Pat also got involved in archery and joined the roving archers of Pasadena. Many of the other members are Olympic. She was very enthusiastic, got several others involved in archery, and she even had her own collection kit. In closing, Pat remained, and for that,
Those were the days when hospitals in California could turn you away if you couldn't show proof of insurance. My fiance at the time was in Princeton, New Jersey, interviewing for a postdoctoral position 3,000 miles away. I gave the hospital Pat's phone number out of desperation. She was there in a flash with her American Express card and made certain I was treated. Also, from what I understand, she verbally set the hospital administrators on fire when she discovered they had left me on a gurney in the hallway for seven hours. After I recovered, Pat got me was only one of the myriad things Pat taught me about the realities of life. And about men, and about relationships, and functioning successfully as a freelance artist. She helped make it possible for my portfolio to, as she put it, to look like I was lined up right, which launched my design career at Mattel Toys. Over the years, we kept in touch, mostly by email. We did a lot of critiques for each other, both art and writing, and exchanged gossips about our former art center classmates. She would send the latest work in progress from Skeptic Magazine for my vote or comments. I sent her an article about cult behavior or a joke, like photos of UFO UFOologist Giorgio Sokopoulos' hair. <laughs> Could it be he was slowly being abducted by aliens? <laughs> <laughs> Another thing Pat taught me is we are all human. We all have complex internal lives that no one else could ever understand. All of us are in denial about something. Otherwise, our lives would be one existential crisis after another. Damn it, Pat, who am I going to ask for? I miss you. I'll miss you deeply for the rest of my life. And it's so amazing that you can hear from everyone else. What makes me the most sad to be your friend is there's nothing that I can say that would pay me a lot of tribute. Thank you, Marty. All right, now I'm on with the words. Yeah, it's just hard to believe. I just uh, <clears throat> can't believe she died. And then you just go to call her. I could like drive down from Santa Barbara you know, once a week, and I always call that just to talk for a couple hours on the drive. And I just go to call her, and it's like, oh, I can call it. So that's the, you know, the shocker of it. So I met Pat 30 years ago, actually, just probably this month, because it was about that time she came over to my house, which is the office now. and. Uh, uh, just to talk about some issues that we were jointly interested in, and that got us talking about uh, revising the old Southern California skeptics thing in the national group. And anyway, one thing went to another, and that ended up being our day jobs. And she was uh, quite good at it. So we were a good combination of, of editorial and artistic. But more than that, just um, you know, she she really uh, engaged in what we were doing of promoting science. And critical thinking and skepticism, and she was really one of the thought leaders of the whole movement. And this goes back to you know, the giants of David Hume and Bertrand Russell and Houdini and Daisy Randy and all the modern skeptics. Pat is every bit as talented, smart, wise as any of them. Just people, as I like to say, she's the most famous skeptic you've never heard of. She didn't want to be known. This was just not her thing. If I ever call her up on stage and tell Peg to make a big deal about it, she would have kicked my ass later for doing that. <laughs> she did not want to do that. We told the story at our little party we had at the office now. You know, one day it was her birthday, so we had a little surprise party for her. People hiding in the kitchen, and she walked by and looked in the window, and then they were like, okay, here we go. She's going to come through the door. She never came through the door. She left. <laughs> so, okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, so that's, you know, that was uh, her temperament, which is uh, fine. 
And, uh, and indeed, I, I, the, the story about the phone calls, it's the goof calls that would call the office, and I was just totally off of the tattoo talking for hours. <laughs> and uh, in a way, just collecting uh, data on why people believe your things, right? And that's what we engaged in. And um, so, but she was also very smart. I mean, just, we would watch Jeopardy a lot. We probably watched, I don't know, 100 hours of Jeopardy. And you know, I'm pretty good at this, I think. The Doc Roth was easy. Different but that was better than anyone I ever saw. And it was kind of frustrating to sit there with her because I was like, I've got to get it before Pat does. <laughs> Bam, she was so good on pretty much any subject. So that, that she was very broadly read, even though you would never know it. Just, just, it's in there. It's in there. And uh, even most of the technical sciences, she kind of had a grasp of what uh, what was going on in any science. Just, she was just that smart. And, uh, yeah, so of course, the artistic contributions, you can see that. It's just on every, in every issue of every cover, and all the artwork she did in there, it's amazing. And some of the stuff over there, I haven't even seen her pre skeptic Art Center Day work. You really see the development of her, uh, of her genius in that way. And, um, and yeah, so let's see, other stories. Well, uh, as I mentioned at our little party, you know, we had our differences. I would have been, uh, you know, we would have our classes. <laughs> And uh, at some point, some, you know, we'd settle it, somebody would apologize, and Pat would always say, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> More often than not, so I, I tend to listen to it. Not just on things about work, but also political issues, social issues, cultural issues, and ideologies, and so on. I changed my mind about a lot of things, just from talking to Pat, even though I would tell him this. <laughs> about the future, we, we will go forward. Um, I mean, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. I don't own it, but, you know, Pat, uh, and, and I just directed it, and we have a fun. Uh, that will continue when uh, the rest of us are, are gone, and, and, uh, and so it's a, truly a movement. I mean, it's, it, will, it will continue, hopefully, decades, even centuries on, like other uh, major institutions do, because we think it is super important, if not more important than ever, we had noticed in the last year or two, uh, this idea of fake news and alternative facts and post-truth nonsense is pretty prominent. And uh, Pat and I would often joke, it's like, I, I think we have job security here. It's, it's not like all of a sudden the world's going to become completely rational and our job is done. It's, it's, uh, it's depressing. We seem to be more important than ever. So we will continue past legacy just through uh, what we're doing. Because that's what you would have wanted. Thank you. Yes. So I can say a few words? Um, yeah. Yes, please. Did you uh, come here though? Uh, and, and, well, but I think people to, to, to come up and speak. Uh, Seth speak it uh, fairly succinctly. Uh, we don't have uh, some others. Well, please do come up because uh, we are broadcasting this, so we can't be here. Hi, I'm Laura Powell. I'm Mr. Sean's mom. And she was actually one of the half of the year. The skill that she gained then. Wood. I mean, it was, it was huge, right? It was big as a cow. <laughs> I always wondered what happened to the cat. It was still in the house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> stories. And, um, and I remember when she first got in the criteria, and then her passion for the huge part of her life. I worked with her a number of times, always at Caltech, with some of ours, and um, there's a involved. And she was my, I think, Amazing Randy's number one fan. Mm -hmm. She just adored, adored him and his role. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just so have so many positive memories. Her making um, of Christmas ornaments with Shoshana and Kimo Do, and I still have those um, ornaments. And sometimes we uh, put up. Um, on the tree bush <laughs> and, and hang them with those up and burn the purple. Um, and it made it a lot of fun to get in that way. So, and I was always grateful when she was able to watch her um, And glad that she went off to spend Christmases every year with the Lindsay family. And I was really grateful for that addition to her life. So, um, thank you for letting me share some memories of.
Hi, my name is Robert Fox. Some people are amazed about Fox. Bob Fox. Hey, folks, up there. Uh, Pat and I were neighbors when she lived on Main Way. And I love that she was an art center student because I wanted to go to art center. But she knew the inside of art center. So she would always show me her projects that she was working on. And one project that I'm sure is still bringing through the hallways at Art Center was she bought a chicken in Chinatown. And she painted that chicken. And everybody was amazed that somebody brought a lot of chicken to Art Center. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, she brought it back to Chinatown and they butchered the chicken. She brought it to me and I cooked it. <laughs> there was so many of those kind of stories that Pat and I just bounced off of each other. And, you know, I'm sorry, Shoshana's mother. I would hear these names of people, and I never knew what they looked like, but she would always talk about them. So when uh, Shoshana's mom was talking about how uh, she loved the, the um, Possums. She would leave her door open so, so this cat could come in and eat. One time she woke up and was a stump eating with the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, things like that. She always threw me little art things because I love penguins. And she would always draw me little cartoon strips of penguins getting eaten by sharks. <laughs> yeah, but it was just great. I think we kept all these, all these things. It was great memories. But what I really loved is that we were all touched by that. She gave us something that we can hang out and hold in our heart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else cheat? I didn't just know that. <laughs> I really do. Uh, you like the whole interaction. And uh, those things all seem uh, you know, I, I resonate so much because I have so many friends who belong to skeptics because I had the unfortunate uh, experience of being both in the military and being this pleasure uh, to hear and witness in such a beautiful life. And uh, whether the only is a good thought. So please, uh, please, we can celebrate this life. And uh, let's do things. Grace of others has loved us well. We gather today in thanksgiving for the one who gave it to us in the life of Pat. She has been known to us through her relationships to us. Daughter, we've always known her as a creative force and a dynamic artist. We now send her on her way, grateful for the time that we shared with her. Confident that she is now in a good place. When we face life and death, we give thanks for our own life, for the many and very goals that Pat played for each of us. May she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. uh, we know we know the cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm.